The city and county of Honolulu continues to look for a new landfill site on Oahu. With all of the proposed sites so far being rejected, ideas have been tossed around about possibly tapping into military or agricultural land. Deadlines to name a new site have passed, and city officials have requested a two-year extension to come up with a new location. Join the conversation on Insights on PBS Hawaii as we discuss the updates on Oahu's new landfill. Next. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Lauren Day. The Waimanalo Gulch Sanitary Landfill opened in 1989. It is located off Farrington Highway just past Ko'olina in West Oahu. According to the city, about 250,000 tons of waste goes into that landfill each year. And about 72% of that is ash and residue from H Power. Last year, the city and county's landfill advisory committee voted to not recommend any of the six proposed new locations leaving the burden of the island's waste on the Waimanalo Gulch. So without a suitable replacement, the city and county recently filed a two-year extension to find a new location. After repeated failed attempts by the city and county to find a suitable replacement, Oahu residents are getting impatient. Mayor Blangiardi is now looking for alternatives and new site locations so that the city and county can follow through with its plan to eventually close Waimanalo Gulch. So what's the latest in Oahu's search for new landfill? We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. As a reminder, you can email or call in your questions at any time. You'll also find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. All right, now to our guests in studio. Roger Babcock Jr. is the director of the Department of Environmental Services for the City and County of Honolulu. He previously directed the city's Department of Facility Maintenance. He holds a PhD in civil engineering and prior to working for the city, he taught civil and environmental engineering at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Gary Weller has been a member of the Kailua board for the last 10 years. He is the president of Mana Ikaika, a data storage center in Kailua. He is also the founding director of the Hawaii Animal Sanctuary, a no-kill shelter at livable Hawaii Kaihui, a charitable organization dedicated to protecting Kailua's land and resources. Ernest Lau is the manager and chief engineer for the Board of Water Supply. He previously served as the administrator of the state's public works division. He worked as the deputy director of the State Commission on Water Resource Management and as the manager and chief engineer of the Kauai Water Department. Kieran Polk is the executive director of the Kapolei Chamber of Commerce, which works on behalf of members to improve the regional and state economic climate to help Kapolei businesses thrive. She spent the last 17 years of her career focused on the West Oahu landscape, and she's also the editor of the annual Kapolei magazine. Thank you to each of you for being in studio tonight. Um, Roger, I'll start with you. Can you sort of paint the picture for us? Um, What's the situation and where are we now? What's the latest with finding a new landfill for Oahu? Yeah, so um, glad to be here, first of all. Thanks for, thanks for uh, having this, this uh, forum. I, um, so environmental services, we, we do take care of, of solid waste as well as, as, well as wastewater. And we, you know, our primary, our primary function is to make sure that all the waste gets collected and it's properly treated and disposed of because as a society we do create waste, uh, both solid waste, you know, garbage and rubbish as well as, as wastewater. And so we've got to take all of these things and, and so what we, how much waste we produce as, a, as, as, a per, as people, as a society is, is really up to us. But how, whatever the residuals are is what, is what we need to deal with. So one of the things is we do need to have a, we do have to have a landfill. Um, and we do lots of things to make sure the landfill, uh, that we landfill as little as possible. And we can talk more about that later. But um, the existing uh, landfill, as you mentioned, has been in operation since 1989. And our waste to energy facility, H Power, has been in operation since 1990, right after that. And as you mentioned, primarily what goes there is ash. In order to operate that facility, we do have to have a landfill. In order to operate the uh, H-Power as part of our permit, we have to have a landfill. So anyway, the, uh, the landfill's been in operation for a long time, and uh, the latest permit uh, extension was in 2019, and there was a decision and order by the Land Use Commission, State Land Use Commission, to uh, uh, 
essentially giving some deadlines of when the landfill needed to close and when a new landfill needed to be identified. A new landfill needed to be identified by December 31st of last year, 2022. Uh, and the landfill needs to be closed by March of 2028. So various efforts happened over the years, uh, and the latest one you mentioned was a, a landfill advisory committee that was uh, began work in 2021, uh, summer of 2021, and finished in summer of 2022, in this last last June. And as you mentioned, they they uh, did not recommend any of the six sites that they had evaluated been evaluating because they were all uh, in what's called the no pass zone and. And Ernie Lau will, will explain that, be able to explain that later more. But um, so basically, we, we kind of had to go back to the drawing board, and because um, those six sites were, were were no longer acceptable. So we, um, with with the timing involved, that they kind of finished their report in June. Uh, we need to do something by December. So we we filed for a, a two-year extension. So. That, you know, back to your main question, which is, what are we doing? So we're evaluating sites that are not in the no-pass zone, but also meet all of the other restrictions that exist. Um, <coughs> the decision in Norway was in 2019, as I mentioned. In 2020, Act 73 was passed, and Act 73 put further restrictions on where a, a landfill could go. Um, it includes a half-mile buffer from a, any residential property, schools, and hospitals are also on that list, and it also eliminates all conservation lands. In addition, we have other restrictions, tsunami inundation zone, so it can't be too close to the coast. Um, we also, it also can't be within 10,000 feet or two miles of an airport. Um, and it also has, um, that, well, those are, the, those are the main, you know, main restrictions. Um, so that, all those things combined rule out um, all, a whole bunch of, of sites. And so we are looking at sites that meet all of those requirements. So that's that's where we're at right now. A lot of moving parts. We're a small island, not a whole lot of options. Yeah. Um, Kieran, why Manolo Gulch is in your community. <laughs> uh, what's the reaction and what are you hearing from residents on West Oahu? Why, you know, it's such an there's such a sense of urgency to find a new landfill location. Well, you know, the Waimanalo Gulch has been there since 1989, but we have had uh, landfills in our community since the 40s. Um, you know, the uh, b before the pr privately owned PVT today, there was um, Pulailai, where the water park is. And then there was, um, before the Wyman Isle Gulch, there was Nanakuli um, land landfill, um, where P PVT is today. And then um, where the Wainai Com Convenience Center, there was um, a Wainai landfill. So we've endured uh, landfills for long enough. Um, originally, the Waimanalo Gulch landfill was uh, scheduled to close in 2004. So even today, we are way past when that was supposed to end from when it was originally set forth. Mm -hmm. um, Ernie, I'll, I'll put this next question for you. Um, can you talk about the no pass zones a little bit more and why the Board of Water Supply, you know, did not support those six proposed sites. So what are the risks, essentially, um, you know, that landfills can pose to our island's water? Yeah, thank you, uh, Lauren. Uh, so maybe I'll start off with the, uh, the concept of the question of where does our drinking water come from? It comes from underground aquifers that are deep underground uh, below our island. Fresh water that is originated as rainfall that is actually floating on the salt water that seeps below our entire island. Uh, this freshwater resource is amazing. It's got a lot of capacity, but it's also very fragile. And I think we, what we see with the situation at Red Hill with the Navy's fuel tanks really has brought home the importance of safe drinking water for our community because Ola Ikavai water is life. So what the island's geology, geology looks like, uh, there, there is something that the Board of Water Supply, and we've been on this position since 1976, almost 50 years ago. Uh, in 1982, we established something called a no-pass zone. So the coastal areas where there is a geologic formation called the cap rock, which is marine sediments, sediments and deposits uh, from erosion also, changes in sea level over time. It's a thick uh, geologic formation that is actually not very permeable, not very porous. 
it helps to protect the precious freshwater resources below it. This cap rock circles the island like a lay around the island, and it's in these areas that we, what we call is the pass zone, where waste disposal facilities such as sanitary landfills are allowed according to the Board of Water Supply rules and regulations that have been in effect almost 50 years now. Uh, so anything on the interior of the island, up Mauka of the snow pass zone or the cap rock, the, the geology is such that the underground aquifer is exposed. There's no protecting cap rock over it. So whatever you put on the ground in you know, the interior parts of the island can eventually get into the groundwater. And we see that from legacy pesticide contamination from large-scale pineapple sugar cultivation, we're still dealing with that. So we're, from our perspective, from the perspective that we have to have a source of safe drinking water for our community, the only uh, real areas that a landfill could safely be constructed is over the cap rock in the past zone on the Makai fringes of our island. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to uh, not a whole lot of options when we've got... Yeah, the, uh, this is a really um, challenging issue. I know I, I feel for Roger and, and Department of Environmental Services because we all generate waste and that waste has to be managed somehow in a safe manner. Uh, but we also need safe drinking water for our community because we can't survive on this island. Uh, the decisions on landfills to, from my perspective, or activities that could potentially contaminate our drinking water we need to weigh those decisions on locations uh, from a long-term view, to think about this from generations to come. Right. So protecting our water resources for the Board of Water Supply is our primary and only mission. Mm -hmm. it's two issues also, we have um, the no pass zones, but also Act 73, am I understanding that correctly? Um, Roger, would you mind explaining for our viewers a little bit about what is Act 73 and why does the city want that repealed? Well, so actually we're not seeking the Act 73 to be repealed, but uh, Act 73 put additional restrictions on where uh, these, these facilities could go in order to um, not have them located close to residents, for example, or schools or hospitals, and also not in um, conservation land areas. And so that, um, that uh, eliminated some of the some of the previously evaluated sites. So la landfill sites have been evaluated for for a long time. There was a blue ribbon panel in 2002, 2004, which was related to the first time that Wyman Olive Gulch was supposed to be um, was it envisioned to be closed. And then in uh, then there was a uh, a mayor's advisory committee in 2011 to 2012 that looked for some sites uh, and identified sites and. There was some uh, and a reevaluation done in 2017, and then that decision in order came in 2019. You got to do something, and so the 22 deadline was set and 28 deadline. Um, so that uh, that eliminated uh, Act 73 eliminated some of the sites that were being evaluated previously. It also uh, and made it so that the PVT landfill couldn't expand any further because it is in a residential uh, area. And so the PVT, which is the only construction and demolition waste landfill uh, on the island, uh, is, um, has, has to close in about five years based on their existing um, uh, capacity. Uh, so about the, uh, in terms of the, the type of uh, amounts of waste that we're talking about, so municipal solid waste that comes to the city is roughly, the size of that waste stream is roughly a million tons per year. Um, and the C and D waste, it varies by year, it depends on the amount of construction and stuff like that, but it's a, about the same size, about another million tons per year. So it's a very significant quantity of material and when that landfill closes, uh, it's gonna come to the city unless some other commercial operation opens up to, you know, to, to take that waste. So it'll have to come to the city. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, so the new landfill that we, that we are trying to site uh, has to account for both of those wastes, mm -hmm. the waste streams. Yeah. Um, Gary, I wanna give you some time as well because you represent our uh, Kailua community. Um, what are the new proposed sites is in you know, your backyard? What issues are there with that site and, and what are you hearing from your community? Well, I wrote a little, story here. 
Kailua's had six landfills. We had our first one in 1940 at the area that is now Akahi Shopping Center. That lasted till 1953. And that was back in the era where Kailua actually had a little airport and a horse racing place. They had a little history there. The next site was where we have our remote control airport out there for hobbyists to fly their helicopters and their planes. That was about 10 acres and that was an ash landfill between 1953 and 1963. And the importance there is that's right on the edge of the marsh. No buffers right on the marsh. Next we had the Kailua dump as it was called in Kapaha Valley, the old quarry site from 1953 to 1972. Then finally we had the Kapaha Central Landfill which consists of the, where the transfer station is today and also the industrial park um, which is called Kapaha Industrial Park. There was a landfill there. And then finally they had Kalaheo Landfill 1986 to 1990. All these landfills have had impacts on the marsh. And the marsh is kind of like the centerpiece of Kailua. You know, it's a um, very special place. It has, in, in, I think, six different endangered bird species there. Um, the marsh is a Ramstar uh, site. Um, the marsh is an area that uh, feeds through Kailua, through Enchanted Lakes and out to the ocean. Uh, we've had many issues with brown water problems and development in Kailua flooding that and getting into the ocean. So we also feel that the Clean Water Act is involved in this picking of our location for a possible landfill. Um, the site that was considered was our quarry, Kapaha Quarry, and there's two sites there, one that has a lake in it that's used as a retention pond, and the new site that's on the other side of the H3, which started its process about, oh, I don't know, about 15 years ago or something like that. Uh, and most of the rock that went from there went to the rapid transit system. So for us, the quarry road is not designed to have the amount of trucks it has right now between the quarry trucks, the cement truck, and the transfer trucks. And in talking to Roger before this happened tonight, I had a figure of 200 trucks more a day would be bringing to us, but he said it would be closer to 300 trucks more to a road that's substandards at best with no divider lines, no, no shoulders on the side of the road and no lights at night at all because of the birds from the marsh. We don't want any lights there. The other issue for us involves the Hawaiians and they have a Heiau site that is smack in the middle of that uh, Kapaha Central Landfill, which is kind of an embarrassment that we surrounded a Heiau site with trash. So that's talked about a lot. Um, when we had a big rainstorm a bunch of years ago, the Quarry Lake actually spilled over, came all the way down the Quarry Road and went into the marsh, and they actually got fined for that. And since that time, there's been some work done to prevent that happening in the future, but that's no guarantee. One of the biggest things is Ernie's no pass zone. It goes all the way to both of the quarries in the area. And then the windward side just has a lot more rainfall. And so that's not conducive to having another landfill in our area. So those are the reasons why the Kailua Neighborhood Board does not want a landfill again in Kailua. Karen, I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear your response to um, you know, what Gary had to say because we've got these two communities that kind of feel the same sentiments when it comes to having a landfill in, in their backyard. Well, yes, and you know, and and thank you for sharing. It was um, good to hear the whole big picture of that, and 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 your story, and and it, every every place um, on this island has a story, and we, um, you know, it, when it comes down to it, it's about the Ina, and I think at the end of the day, we're looking at at that 
issue underneath all of it. So I completely respect everything that you share shared. Um, you know, I think it's been said since day one because we've we've been the last one on the ticket that it's someone else's turn. And I think that's the underlying sentiment. But also we have in West Oahu not only just the Waimanala Gulch Landfill, we have the power plant, we have H power. Um, and quite honestly, quite a bit of solar power, everything else in between. And we are growing the second urban core in Kapolei. It's happening. So with all that being said, you know, it's just, it's time. It's time to move that to another part of this island. And I do commend, um, I do commend the city and their efforts to, for all that's being done to reuse and regenerate because I think that's a key piece that we need to keep focusing on um, in this big picture too. Mm -hmm. It's multifaceted, but it's our turn's done. And, and that's really the, the, the heart of it. Um, I know that um, Roger mentioned uh, uh, Act 73 and, and uh, that's great news to hear that it's not looking to be repealed because that is a huge issue for our community came up in 2019 um, when there was an extension uh, looking at PBT's extension and our community said look you know it's there's a reason why there's there needs to be a buffer zone when you have a landfill in your backyard there are health issues that are a result of that um, there are environmental issues as well mm -hmm. I mean the soil contaminants will be there for 30 years to come after it's closed but it's, it's been proven that where a landfill is, there's higher rates of cancer, there's respiratory illnesses, including asthma, that occur. And so all these things need to be taken in, into consideration. And our community is saying enough. We've, we've held it for, for long enough. Yeah. I, I do want to get to some of our viewer questions because we have a lot of them. <laughs> kind of just piggy, piggyback offing what you mentioned about um, you know, sort of the health repercussions of having a landfill so close um, in your backyard. Um, this question is from a viewer named Sheila. Are there laws or restrictions prohibiting people from dumping harmful chemicals at the landfill that could possibly later affect our water supply? Um, Roger, Ernest, I'll let either of you chime in on that. Yes, absolutely. So uh, landfills are, are a really highly regulated um, operation. So there are... Uh, solid waste disposal uh, permit that's required, there's air permits, and there's um, stormwater permit, and uh, so it's very, it's very regulated in terms of what can go in there also. So yeah, no hazardous waste is allowed at a landfill. So it's a, it's a, it's a RECRA permitted class D landfill, which is a municipal solid waste landfill, which uh, uh, only a class C landfill is, uh, is allowed to take a hazardous waste, and we have nothing like that here. So all hazardous waste generated on the island is uh, is shipped off island now, so um, that, that doesn't happen. So harmful chemicals are, are not allowed. Um, there's very little actual residential uh, use of the, of the landfill directly. So most waste is collected um, curbside. You know, we have the uh, gray cart, the green cart, and the blue cart. Uh, gray cart goes to H power and, and gets turned into ash and, and lots of electricity, 10% of our electricity. Um, the green cart is uh, green waste. It gets converted into compost at a, at a composting facility. And then blue waste is, blue cart is all recyclable, right? Metals and plastic and paper, and that all gets recycled. And, and that is, of course, shipped mm -hmm. somewhere else to be, to be reused. Um, hazardous waste, uh, we have um, at least twice a year, or maybe quarterly, we have a hazardous waste collection day uh, where the, people can, can drop off those materials. We include paint and solvents and other and batteries and other things like that. We'll, we'll collect that at that time. What happens if someone doesn't follow those rules and maybe they put the hazardous waste in the green bin or in, you know, in a trash bag in their, in their regular black bin? Does that, could that like then leak out and impact our water supply? Well, so if it goes in a gray bin, a uh, gray cart, it's gonna go to H power and it's gonna be burned. Um, but it's, you know, liquid waste and stuff are not, are not part of our permit. Um, probably there is some, you know, that, that ends up there. Um, but what goes, to, what goes to the landfill, as you mentioned, is primarily ash. 
and ash does have metals and other things in it. Um, the ash is processed and, uh, before it goes there uh, and to remove metals, but it's not 100% removal. Um, and so, uh, but all landfills, uh, RECRA D landfill has a, has a liner. So it has a liner system that's required by law. And the liner is actually a, it's called a liner system because it actually has two parts of a liner. It has a synthetic plastic, thick plastic layer, and it also has a clay layer. Um, and those are, those are on the bottom. And then there's a drainage layer before the, before the material is placed. Mm -hmm. And then there's a sump area. And so water that infiltrates through the landfill becomes what we call leachate. That leachate comes to a, to a sump and it's pumped out continuously so by the, from, each, from each cell. And so that material would contain anything, that would contain any, wa any waste that wasn't authorized or liquid materials that, that, that was permeated there. So, pr so protect the water below is the liner system. And so the, the leachate is taken out, it's treated and, and disposed. Um, the, uh, if there was a, uh, so in addition to the requirements are you have to monitor the groundwater below the landfill that could be impacted. So. Um, Groundwater, as as uh, Ernie would mention, would would mention, is that it it comes, it hits the mountains and it flows down and then towards the ocean, and so there, you know groundwater is generally always moving, so it would be moving underneath the landfill, and so the requirements are that you have to have monitoring wells above and below the landfill, and we have to monitor those for our permits on a quarterly basis, and for that landfill, um, we there's never been any indication that. Uh, anything has leaked out. So, if it did, we would we would know about it. Um, and so, yeah, that that's how the the groundwater is protected. You know, directly related to that yeah. question. If anything were to leak out, Ernie, how does the Board of Water Supply get involved or hear about that, um, and then you know find a solution or or clean it up? So once it gets out of a landfill, say uh, the the liners don't keep the leachate in the landfill effectively. And uh, you know we also have to think of landfills as permanent facilities. Once put there, they're there forever. Uh, so how long will the liner system actually last and perform? Well, if it fails and it leaks, and it's detected in the groundwater wells that are required to be installed around the landfill, then it's in the groundwater and it's like Roger saying, flowing with the, the water in that aquifer. We have a lot of wells that pump from that very same connected aquifer. If the, we start to detect the contaminants uh, from the landfill, and, and the leachate is pretty, pretty contaminated stuff, uh, and there's no way around that. It's picking up everything that's uh, in the landfill, and I think PFAS is one of the chemical uh, contaminants that is of growing concern nationally on, on landfills. So once that reaches our drinking water well, we start to detect it, then our options are if it's possible, can we treat the, the water to make it safe to drink, to remove the contaminants? Or if it's not possible to treat, then we'll have to go look for another well at a different location that won't be impacted by the, the plume, contaminant plume emanating from the landfill. Uh, so uh, just remember that our underground aquifers are all hydrologic, uh, hydraulically connected. Mm -hmm. uh, so and there's a lot of variability, so we, it's really hard to predict where that contaminant plume may end up and which well could be impacted. We have about 90 plus well stations around the island of Oahu. A lot of it's on the interior part of the island uh, where we have the most fresh water that's easy to, to be developed. In the Caprock areas, that's not a good area to develop a water well for a drinking purpose. Uh, it'll be saltier and lower capacity, so we go toward the interior of the island. And thus, that's why our position is that these types of facilities should be on the coastal areas over the Caprock mm. in the pass zone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, given the Navy's disaster at Red Hill recently, do you think that they would be willing to help out with the new landfill? You know, I'm, uh, I'm not one that's in discussions with them on that. Uh, and I kind of leave it up to Roger and, and the mayor and talking to the military. Uh, I am in discussions with them about Red Hill and uh, their impact on our water resources, the crisis they've created there. Um, hopefully they'll be very open in trying to work collaboratively with the community because uh, I'll tell you, 
trust in the military right now is probably at its all-time low, and they need positive things, uh, I think, to help rebuild that trust with the community. What better way than taking some of their land that they're not fully utilizing it for some of these facilities uh, that our community also needs? Yeah. Um, we have a, a bunch more viewer questions. A couple of these are people asking about, you know, have specific sites been considered? So maybe I'll read um, these three off and then Roger, anyone can chime in. Um, since they're all talking about, you know, specific locations, was XYZ considered? So the first one is, what about next to Schofield Barracks near the current site of a nearby convenience center? That's from Paolo on Facebook. And then someone else asked, have you considered the Cunia area in the old pineapple fields as a location? That's from Margaret in Wailua. And then the other one is, what about Kamilo Nui Valley out in Hawaii Kai? Was that considered? Yeah, so all those sites were considered. Um, the Schofield Barracks site was, is, uh, would be um, both probably excluded by the uh, residential half mile limitation as well as it's, oh, it's in the no pass zone. Uh, Hawaii Kai, uh, it would also be, w there's no sites out there that are not within the half mile, half mile buffer and outside of the uh, no pass zone. Uh, Kunia is the same thing. It's, there's, there's, a, it's, the, it, X73 excludes, exclude those areas. Um, really the only sites that are available are some military, are some military lands. And so, as Ernie mentioned, we are in discussions with them, but, um, that is, um, that is, you know, to be determined whether that's going to whether that's going to work out for us. Um, but that's, uh, yeah. Um, so there's not there's not too many options. Is there a possibility of changing some of those restrictions to find a new home for a landfill? So right. So as I mentioned, we weren't trying. We're we're not proposing to uh, um, repeal Act 73. But it could be that there could be a. Uh, an amendment or something that would free up um, a site somewhere, uh, but but that with without in consideration of the no pass zone, there's very little possibility of that of that happening. Mm -hmm. Would um, I know this was mentioned previously, not tonight, but um, in the news? Would the city use eminent domain to find a new location for a landfill? That's possible, and we've looked into that, um, and we're still looking into it a little bit more, but there's very little promising uh, potential there. Mm -hmm. The site needs to be quite large. Um, 100 acres, roughly, is what we're looking at. Um, the the Waimanalo Gulch landfill is 200 acres. You know, it's been, it's been expanded. Uh, but we, um, we, are, we are doing a, um, an ash recycling project right now, which will reduce the amount of ash that we produce by about 60 percent, mm -hmm. which essentially kind of doubles the doubles the life of the landfill. Uh, that's in uh, the early phases of um, of planning and design, and we're currently uh, in a permitting phase. Um, but it's it's been funded. We we anticipate fully anticipate that we'll we will be able to implement that project, and it'll take a few years. Um, so so that's helpful, but it it doesn't eliminate the need, you know, for for a landfill. So yeah. yeah. Um, I, I want to kind of turn things back to Kieran and Gary. I know, Gary, before we started, we were kind of chatting, and you had mentioned when your community heard the words imminent domain, um, people got very nervous. Um, yes, <laughs> they certainly did. We, we received a lot of emails and, and phone calls from people wanting to know what that would be about. And, and there may have been a misconception, but the news did a story where they showed a whole group of homes in the background of the story where they would do that. And that really made people anxious to find out if that was going to be true or not. And I don't, I don't think the public would stand for that. But I, I, I did want to mention one thing that Roger said. We do have to remember that some of the landfills in her area and my area was before the EPA took over managing landfills and making the rules. So many of the landfills uh, did not have that barrier that you're talking about. And we don't know what the long-term effects of those landfills might be, especially if we ever had a tremendous 40 days of rain again, or a tsunami, or some, some 
other act like that that would be different than the normal situations. Um, so some of, some of us are still vulnerable to those older places that aren't really being tested the way they should. Um, in the closure of some of ours in our neighborhood, uh, the city and the Department of Health is supposed to do ongoing testing, but they, they test for very little amounts of, of, of the elements that could possibly be uh, polluting the marsh. Um, there's a site by where that airplane park is, and I don't think anybody's tested there in years, and it was a requirement of the closure of that ash place. And so um, in our research, we started asking the Department of Health for their testing at all the locations, Kabaha Stream over there. Uh, Right by the transfer station is the pump, it, what did you call it, where you pump out the residue? The leachate collections. The leaching thing. Yeah. We used to see the truck there all the time, and I hardly <coughs> see the truck anymore anymore. Maybe there's not enough leaching to take out of there anymore. But So these are some of the, the issues that have affected us. In Kailua, you know, we basically told people we don't know where there'd be any 100 acres site that you could possibly use in Kailua. Um, we did get some people from Waimanalo talking to us that there would be land in Waimanalo that would be equivalent to 100 acres, but it's probably in the no-pass zone where the old um, mm. uh, cattle ranch was where, where I think it was Metagold had a, a, a dairy up there. But that's the only land that we could find that was like close to 100 acres that could be possibly a landfill that, right. that's still vacant, but it's ag land, and I don't think that that would be a potential. Um, Kieran, are you hearing anything from your community, or do you have a preference on where a new site may go? You know, I, I leave the selection up to <laughs> to the administration. I mean, that, that that's their, their task is been so much work and I think we've talked about that over the years. I mean this isn't just something that has happened one time. Um, I think at the end of the day I'm repeating myself a little bit but it's really about where we really are done and, and one of the concerns is and I hear it from my community is okay the selection times extended when are they going to extend again that landfill date and it goes on and on and on. And then I know Roger mentioned um, the construction uh, waste piece of it, you know, and there will be a time where our construction facility, a private construction facility, they will term out. And then that affects the cost of goods, a cost of how, uh, uh, um, construction. So there, it's, there's layers to that. But the, at the end of the day, my community's like, okay, we're done. And, and we don't, need to carry that burden anymore and for that matter we're going to be living with this for years to come mm -hmm. you know and so i don't know that they're pointing fingers you know there's a lot of you know there's a lot of restrictions yes i think a sensitivity on our side is definitely act 73 in that that half mile buffer zone um there were hundreds in my community that came out to speak against it in 2019 and you know, at the, at the heart of it, it's about environmental justice and social justice when you, when you look at it and doing what's on what's right. Mm -hmm. we, that's a great transition because we have a, a lot of viewer questions kind of asking about maybe some other solutions besides just, um, you know, finding a landfill on Oahu. Uh, so this first question is from one of our viewers. Has shipping rubbish out of state uh, been looked at? Yes, it's been looked at many times. Uh, most recently, uh, in 2009, it was uh, it was piloted. Uh, it was it was um, it was the, the, that service was offered by an out-of-state uh, company uh, in Washington State, and they were going to uh, ship all the rubbish to there to a to a landfill. Um, and so the operation would involve bailing of uh, refuse and uh, having it then loaded in containers and, and shipped to, to Washington. And the bailing operation started, was piloted, um, and, uh, but the shipping never happened because they couldn't get the permits they needed to, uh, to, to, for the disposal. 
So that's a kind of a, you know, it's an interesting um, concept. The, uh, but one of the things you got to, that you have to remember is, for example, we have an ordinance on, on Oahu that says we will not accept waste from, from, from outside anywhere. And other counties have that same, mm. that same ordinance, right? So um, we have a hard enough time uh, disposing of our own waste. So we, we need to have an ordinance that says, no, no matter what, um, we're not going to take waste from outside. Um, that means a private company can't do that either, not, not just the city. So somebody can't just buy some property and decide, well, I want to take in waste from California or from Kauai or from somewhere like that. And other counties have that same kind of thing. So it's quite difficult, you know, to get that to happen, not just because of the distance, but because nobody wants mm -hmm. the waste from Honolulu to come to their community either. Yeah, I know the concept of zero waste is, you know, a, a golden idea. Um, we do have someone ask, actually asking about that. Why are we even using landfills in the first place? There are communities that have zero waste that go to landfills like Huntington Beach, California. Um, there's another question. I'm not sure if somebody wants to weigh in on that one. Is that even something that could be feasible, let's say, 10, 20 years down the road? Yeah, I don't know if 10 or 20 years, but eventually that's, that's the goal, uh, is to steadily reduce the waste stream. And the waste stream is being, is reduced, is being reduced. We, we produce... Uh, less waste um, over time. We're going to do the ash recycling, etc. cetera. Um, and zero would of, course be, would, would, of course, be a target. That requires large uh, lifestyle changes for all of us. So it means that um, that, that needs to happen, including, including the way we, we need to recycle all of our construction waste. We need to recycle everything that's recyclable. And that would involve um, businesses, uh, Individ, you know, individual homeowners, uh, residents, um, and uh, you know, kind of really changing our lifestyle a lot and the way we do all of our packaging, the way things arrive. Um, you know, there's boxes and, and, and shipping and, and materials and plastic and all this stuff that, that we are used to um, using and the way, we, the way we buy things in packaging that's disposable. If we were willing to bring our own plastic containers to the store and catch everything and reuse that and not have any paper or any other packaging, then you know that's that's theoretically possible. Um, and I think we're we're continually will be working towards that. Um, but in the end, I think you know that'll take you know that'll take a long time for that to be you know fully achievable. Yeah. Speaking of sort of a lifestyle change for all of us, um, the Board of Water Supply issues notices when residents need to conserve water. Um, Ernie, do you think that residents and companies should also be thinking about reducing the amount of trash that we produce? Well, in support of my friend Roger, I would say yes. Uh, but coming back to water conservation, I think we can do more. And you know, com companies and businesses, you know, got to look for ways to uh, use less water. And, I, and I've been talking to a lot of businesses uh, in the last year plus uh, because of the Red Hill crisis and um, they are really open to it. Uh, even gray water recycling on their property, uh, reducing stormwater runoff, using it on site, uh, reducing how much we have to pump out of our underground aquifers. Those are all steps in the right direction so I really appreciate that. Um, We'll need everybody's help with water conservation, especially every summer. We're coming up on another summer. Every summer, because of the Red Hill situation, we've had to shut down our one of our largest water sources, Halava Shaft. We're going to need uh, help reducing our usage, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the Honolulu and IA systems. Mm -hmm. uh, Kieran, I'm curious to hear from you. You hear from businesses on the west side mm -hmm. um, probably every day. Mm -hmm. um, are there any talks in that community um, and I would hope for other communities as well, but to maybe conserve on trash and kind of shift our mindset like what Roger was saying. You know, I think it's on the minds of most, we're in a sustainable uh, world that, and that's, we, we're all driven um, to do that. I think with climate change and environmentally conscious uh, consciousness coming to the forefront. So that is definitely there. The challenge, the, I think the business community at large and many small businesses especially have is the cost inc incurred piece mm -hmm. to make these changes. And the, the want and the desire and the uh, intent is there, 
but it also comes down to can these small businesses especially um, sustain those changes or how the, is that transition and those are the things I think um, as a business community uh, as a whole we're trying to find those ways where we don't have the mom and pop businesses going out of out of business because they can't afford to uh, you know fit the bill for those higher dollar changes or how do we transition in a way that makes sense and it's a balance right so I think those are the things that we're constantly looking at and having those discussions and finding ways to be creative um, and look and, and, and I think some of it's awareness and um, and consciousness and like Ernie mentioned I mean there's so many ways to conserve water people don't realize sometimes it's bringing it to their awareness and their consciousness like hey did you know if you do XYZ that you'll save this much in water and I think at the end of the day people want to do the right thing I have parts of my community that were affected by the Red Hill uh, crisis so it is front and center. They're one of my members of the chamber. Mm -hmm. um, recently, the mayor spoke to Civil Beat and mentioned the idea of searching for solutions, possibly on military or agricultural lands. Um, maybe Roger or Ernie could take this. Are there any realistic options in either area? Well, not in agriculture. The agricultural lands are typically all in the uh, no-pass zone. Um, I did want to mention that the uh, the Waimanaal Gulch landfill is in the pass zone. It, it is not in the no pass area, so it's one of the few areas that's you know that is it's okay. Um, and uh, so, but there are some military there are some military sites that are outside of the no pass zone um, that um, are feasible in that sense. They also would not run astray of Act 73, so technically they're um, they're possible. And so we are. You know, we are we are looking at that. You know, with with the military to try to see if we could use use some of those sites. And the military, of course, has uses for their lands, and um, and uh, they also would always be thinking about the future and what could change or happen that they would then somehow need these need these places that um, could forever possibly be altered and not be you know not be available if it becomes a landfill. Mm -hmm. I did want to mention, uh, if, if I may, that um, uh, where we talked about leachate and, and, and landfills producing, you know, toxic things, um, they, are, they are sealed, you know, on the bottom while they're in operation. And as they uh, go through their life, uh, it's, it's closed as you move along. And so only the working area remains sort of open. And, and closure is a requirement of the operation of a landfill. And what that means is you put an impermeable, just like the liner that's on the bottom, also goes on the top. And so then no more rainfall goes in there. And so there's no more leachate produced. So leachate is produced by water that comes in. Uh, once, once it's closed like that, then it's not going to produce leachate anymore. Uh, and so there's, no really, there's really no more risk. In addition, while it's in operation and we're collecting leachate, we're only allowed to have... 18, inch, 18 to 24 inches of leachate in the bottom of the landfill at any time. So we have to continuously pump it out and treat that and dispose of it. So it's not like it's a big tank of water where if there was somehow a leak that a whole bunch of stuff's going to leak out. Mm -hmm. um, we have to uh, continuously remove that material. So um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's very different like from a Red Hill tank or something like that. Yeah. Um there's already one military landfill on Kaneohe Marine Corps Base. Do you think the military would be willing to host another landfill? Um, Roger, or uh, even er Ernie as well, because you've been in talks with them. I'm not sure if you've got, gathered any intel. Uh, when I talk to the military, I don't talk about landfills. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, we think it's possible, but um, the discussions are, you know, ongoing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, realistically, even if, let's say, the mayor picks a location by the end of this year, what happens next? How quickly can that get moving? Yeah, so, I mean, we actually have money budgeted to uh, purchase land and, uh, and develop a landfill um, already, already budgeted. So um, that, that's a possibility. But you're correct. There would be several steps that still have to happen. There has to be environmental uh, study done, environmental assessment. Uh, impact statement um, there that involves public hearings and lots of studies and evaluations 
it would have to get through that process. Um, then, and only after that, would the land actually be purchased. Um, if it was military land, it probably wouldn't be. It would probably be a lease. It wouldn't be a sale. Um, but you've got to go through that whole process. Uh, then you've got to um, design it, get it permitted, construct it, and then, and then open it. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a process that will, will take some time. And, um, but it's, it's necessary to, uh, in, order to, um, in order to open uh, and, and legally operate a, a landfill. Yeah. Um, I'll go back to Kieran and Gary. For both of you, and maybe Kieran, I'll, I'll start with you just because you're closest. Um, anything you'd like to say to your community men members when it comes to you know, how they should think about this situation? Because I know it's definitely a touchy one for folks that live on the west side. Well, first of all, I, I'd like to acknowledge, um, I know the mayor has expressed that he doesn't have the intent to have the landfill on the, on the west side. And so I, I've uh, thanked him for that. And, and um, that is a, a hopeful statement as well. But I, I think I just would say at, overall to our community that, you know, I, I appreciate all of the all of the um, the fervor and the the heart of how we feel, and we we, we should hold hold to that, but know that um, that it, things are going in the right direction. And I refer back to to um, some of the things that Roger shared tonight, as well as like I said, the mayor's mayor's words. And 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 I think um, you know it goes back to what I was just t talking about that environmental justice and social justice piece and doing what's Pono and I think that's what at the end of the day we're trying to do but again we have all these restrictions we have all these rules to work around and it's taken a little bit longer to get there but hang in there because we're close and and I think that's the hard part for West Oahu because I joke about this all the time. I'm like, I have to jump up and down for the west side because we've had those challenges in many facets. Um, but I think this one is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Gary, anything for you to those on the windward side? Uh, on a positive note, um, over my life in Hawaii since it started in 74, I've seen some very interesting changes and in whether or not it was government that forced these upon contractors and people or people started to get their consciousness in the right place. But I remember when they took down Kaiser Hospital in Waikiki, they buried it in Waimanalo. And so back in those days, it was a, you know, you just did whatever you had to do and you, you found a landowner and the place was a deep valley and you just made a deal with them and they covered it over with dirt. and. It wasn't discovered for years later. And now today, you probably can't get away with that anymore. And so that's on the positive note that attitude has changed. And, and for small contractors, they now know to sort out their site. They put the concrete in one bin, the metal in another bin, you know, the wood goes in another bin. And so, so there is some positive things that are occurring. But I, I think education is still important. You know. Uh, it seems like we're, we're driving towards getting kids at a very young age to understand waste, um, composting, things that could be done to lessen this amount. Um, I think more could be done for recycling in terms of, like I noticed that bottles and cans are still five cents and that rule has been in for a very long time now. Maybe that should be 10 or 15 cents. Other states have done that. Um, cause it's dipping right now. Right. The state is getting more and more money that they don't have to refund to the people. And so that tells me that the recycling programs that were started when, when I had my green waste recycling facility <clears throat> are not working anymore. So that there's got to be an incentive for people to do this. And people need to be reminded, like in, I was telling Roger earlier, in the beginning of recycling over here, we had entertainers singing about it. They were on TV. People, there was a consciousness to recycled materials. I don't see that anymore. Yeah. So we, we kind of forgot what we were doing with all that. 
think at its core, it's all of us have to. Yes, together. and, and um, you know, think twice about it, you know, and, and is, is it the right thing to do? And, and like, I, I, I can't tell you that people are not going to turn over some bottle and see if it's recyclable or not. Yeah. It's got to be something that's very easy for people to do. I, I don't want to, I don't mean to cut you off. I just want to make sure we, uh, I give this the last couple of seconds here to both of you. Um, anything you'd like to say to the community? I know this is a topic that has been years and years to get to the finish line, but anything you'd like to say to the community about, you know, Board of Water Supply's effort to be involved in the discussion and what's next? Yeah, maybe I'll, I, I can start. So yeah, we work closely with uh, Board of Water Supply. We want to make sure we protect the, uh, the drinking water. And uh, so we're completely committed to that. We're on the same. We're all on the same page. Um, and we are going to. We do. We do need to find a new site for uh, uh, the next landfill. The mayor has committed, as Kieran mentioned, that it will not be on the west side. Um, there's very few sites available. None of them are in Kailua. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at military sites. Um, I wanted to just add on that recycling is really important part of what we do, and mm -hmm. people need to need to do that. Soon we'll be we'll be putting our green our food waste into the okay. green waste and I'm, composting. I'm so sorry to cut you sorry, off. Sorry, go ahead. I know, yeah, yeah. I know we just are unfortunately yeah. running out of time here. Um, thank you all for sure. joining us tonight, and we want to thank our viewers. Um, Roger Babcock, Jr., Director of the City's Department of Environmental Services. Ernest Lau, I wish I could have given you a last word as well, Manager and Chief Engineer of the Board of Water Supply. Gary Weller, Kailua Neighborhood Board Member, and Kieran Polk, Executive Director of the Kapolei Chamber of Commerce. Um, Thank you all for joining. Next week on Insights, what is the latest on the Alawai flood control project? The Alawai watershed is one of the most densely populated and economically important areas on Oahu. So what is the plan to protect businesses and residents from severe weather? Please join us then. Have a great night.